So we will start the presentation. Um, Arathne has been kind to um, to put this together and she's gone to quite a bit of trouble with a good presentation over here. And um, well, I'm sure we're all interested to see the, the, um, the, the, the slides. I will try and get this started. We have a little introduction here of a um, musical uh, Polynesian music. Geography, which many of you will, I'm sure already know about the Pacific geographic realm. The largest total area of any realm. I haven't put this on. Do I need to? You do. Okay. I just need to put the microphone on. Sorry. Can you hear? Yeah, yeah, good. Okay, so a little bit of geography to start with, Pacific realm. Largest area of any realm, as you reckon for a moment, vast distances, distances between uh, separating the island states. We have high islands and low islands, dichotomies of econ economic and social and cultural norms between those high and low islands. Strong navigation and sailing traditions 
historic migrations of the people. Uh, in the West, we have sort of tropical images of the Pacific uh, in the literature, but really harsh, quite, quite harsh physical environment realities. So a little bit of uh, geography again, physical regions. We have the Pacific Ring of Fire with subduction, deep ocean trenches, which form the island arcs and lots of volcanism, earthquakes and so on, particularly on the western side, but all around the Ring of Fire. So we, as I said, high islands with elevated terrain, geologically younger, volcanic origin, and they certainly feature in Melanesia. So, for example, uh, and in the South Pacific, Tahiti, American Samoa. The low islands are coral atolls and reefs. Geologically older, remnants of eroded high islands. They feature in Micronesia and with the high islands in Polynesia. And they're very contrasting environments. So natural resources, for example, soils, water, and land use and settlement vary greatly between the high islands and the low islands. As far as climate goes, maritime climates, greatest rainfall is in the equatorial and Pacific, tropical Western Pacific. The ITCZ, Intertropical Convergence Zone, which spans both the Pacific and the Atlantic. And the South Pacific Convergence Zone. There are drier areas in the Eastern Pacific. That's the TDZ, the Pacific Dry Zone over in the East. And of course, this interrelates when we get our La Ninas and our El Nino patterns relates to these uh, these um, bands of rainfall. Um, seasonality varies with latitude and temperatures are pretty much um, stable, not much uh, seasonal vari variability because of the maritime climate. So temperatures tend to be fairly even throughout the year. The high islands create orographic generally wetter than the, than the low islands. So this sort of thing. On the windward sides of islands, you get a lot of rainfall. For example, on Oahu in Hawaii, the windward side, very wet, up to 300 inches rain, uh, rainfall. Down on Waikiki, it's a desert, uh, very little rain. So that sort of pattern. Um, and of course, we have the regional tropical storms, cyclones, which develop right across the Pacific, uh, Northern Pacific, Southern Pacific, and this is when we have our La Nina pattern and we get it on our east coast. Okay, so a little bit of geography to start with, physical geography. What about the Polynesians? That's what we're focusing on this morning. Where did they come from? So initially they came from southern China, it's thought, and lots, lots of um, archaeological evidence now. But they came out of southern China maybe 2,000 years before the Christian era. And they reached Samoa, Fiji, Tonga by about 800. After a long pause, it's felt, they then sailed to the Cook Islands and populated Tahiti, Rapa Nui, which is Easter Island, Hawaii and Aotearoa, New Zealand. So there's quite a gap between the original migration out of uh, Asia and then across into the Pacific. I'll talk some more about that. Um, archaeology and genetics have proposed many dates for this migration. Of course, it's uh, you know, in the midst of time, it's a bit hard to know exactly what happened when. Uh, they generally, though, lie between the range of 400 to 1300 Christian era, and as you probably know, New Zealand Maori settled New Zealand 
around 1200-1300. Okay, so talking today about the Polynesians, so here's the group of islands that comp uh, comprise Polynesia, and poly, of course, means poly uh, many. And uh, this is the great Polynesian Triangle. And I'm talking about a few places during the presentation, so I've marked them here. Micronesia, Caroline Islands becomes quite uh, significant in terms of the navigators that we're going to talk about. Here's Hawaii in the North, North Pacific. Uh, here's Melanesia over here, outside of the Polynesian Triangle. The Marquesas, the Society Islands, Tuamotu Archipelago. Easter Islands way over here, but still part of Polynesia. And of course, New Zealand is the southern, southwestern corner of Polynesia. European exploration of the Pacific, as Len said in his introduction, uh, probably the first European to sight the Pacific Ocean in 1513 was the Portuguese, the Portuguese explorer Magellan. He made landfall in the Marianas in Micronesia. Subsequent to that, many voyages by Europeans, of course, went into the Pacific and it took centuries. They found many of the islands, but it took until 1778 before Hawaii was found and, and landfall was made. So there's the Spanish voyages, lots of them. Interestingly, the Europeans, as they sailed across the Pacific, they missed a lot of the islands, of course, and they missed the people who were there. So they really didn't know. Uh, who was there and that they were, in, you know, passing inhabited islands. When encountering Polynesians, the Europeans did neglect to ask, you know, how exactly they did their navigation and how, how did this double hole canoes work? They didn't ask actually. So we don't have a lot of records from the European times of, um, you know, what the Europeans uh, found from the Polynesians. From uh, here, enter James Cook, of course, from 1769 to 1779, James Cook made three voyages, crisscrossing the Pacific, looking for Terra Australis. <laughs> and uh, he, he really um, was, you know, did more exploration of the Pacific than any other European explorer. When he went to Tahiti to mark the transit of Venus in 1769, he came across a Tahitian Tupaya who was a navigator. And this becomes very significant later on. We'll, we'll come back to Tupaya. But as I said, Cook was, you know, probably um, he did more exploration in the Pacific than any other European. Unfortunately, as I'm sure you know, uh, there was a skirmish when in, on his second um, trip to the big island of Hawaii. There was a skirmish and Cook was killed. Probably, you know, there's all sorts of tales about what happened and why. It was probably a bit of an accidental thing. Uh, nevertheless, yes, he died in Te Bay on the Big Island in 1779, sadly. And he never did find that Northwest Passage. That, that's what he was trying to do. He, he did first, the first uh, uh, visit to Hawaii was so successful, they thought he was a god coming over the horizon on this big ship with white sails. Everybody had a great time. And he sailed off again, trying to find the Northwest Passage. He was caught up in a storm in the North Pacific, as, as happens in winter. And uh, then he sort of trailed back to Hawaii. And when the Hawaiians saw his ship all wrecked and the sails all broken and the mast was, huh, this guy's not a god. <laughs> so he got somewhat of a different uh, reception, but nevertheless,
New Zealand. And when they got to New Zealand, amazingly, Tupia was able to communicate straight away with the Maori. And Cook was amazed. He perplexed. How could these populations, separated by 4,000 kilometres from Tahiti to New Zealand, communicate in the same language? How did that happen? So, uh, there's the question that had began, uh, you know, befuddled European explorers ever since. Days. So he found, whenever Cook found habitated, habitable islands and habited by people, tiny islands in a vast ocean, why did those people get there? Where did the Polynesians come from? People who lived in places separated could speak virtually the same language. How could that be? So here was the, the voyage that they did, Cook and Tupai, 4,000 kilometres. So let's just uh, say a few words about Tupia. He is a very important figure, significant figure. We don't hear much about the Polynesian explorers or their navigators. We hear a lot about Cook, of course, and the Europeans. Uh, he was born around 1725 in Waiatea, part of the Society Islands. He was an Ariori, uh, a high priest. He, for some reason, and you know, if you read up a bit more about him, he had been sort of exiled to part of the uh, the island chain, maybe fallen foul of some of the chiefs or something. But nevertheless, he had trained as a navigator. His memorized knowledge included islands, size of the islands, the reefs and the harbor locations, whether they were inhabited, and if so, the name of the chief and the food produced there for all of these islands. And this is his map. This is Tupia's map of the Pacific. Uh, uh, stretches right across quite a lot, not quite as far as New Zealand, but a lot of the island groups around here. He had a mental map of them. He knew the bearings of each island, the time needed to get there, and the succession of stars to follow. And this becomes important when we talk about the navigation course. Um, it included all of these groups on his map. And he showed, he showed Cook the map. And again, Cook was very intrigued. How did this person know? And how did he get there? Um, using no nav modern navigation aids. So, again, Cook used Tupia's skills on his voyage. But, you know, when you think about it, why didn't the Europeans ask the Polynesians? Where did, how did you get here? Uh, and there's the Polynesian cultural origin story, which, you know, we, we know partly. Um, the stories usually identify a place called Hawaii. Hawaii. It's sort of mythological. And a number of Pacific Islands have Polynesian names that sounds similar, but no physical location has been identified in fact. Some societies refer to it as the underworld. You might think of the big island of Hawaii, Hawaii. it's sort of like that, but it's not Hawaii. Um, in Maori tradition, Hawaii is the place from where their ancestors sailed. It's the place where the world and its people were created. So it's a creation story by the supreme being, being Eo. They believe every person comes from there and will return there after dying. There's also a legend, and again, it gets back to our story in, uh, later about the voyage from Tahiti to Hawaii. Um, they had a legend that the, the uh, star formation, the Pleiades, seven stars, related to the seven islands of Hawaii. So it's a bit of a legend there and a connection with the star charts. Okay, so how did the Polynesians get to those remote islands? Scattered over thousands of islands across the central and southern Pacific, they were master navigators who tracked their way over huge expanses of ocean without any of the complex mechanical aids we associate with seafaring. 
They didn't have astrolabe, sextant, compass, or the chronometer, and of course, no GPS. Mm -hmm. And they did, however, have what was repositories of extremely complex knowledge about the ocean, astronomy, marine, and bird life. And this is what they used. So, Polynesian wayfinding. And this is a, an artist's impression of a wayfinder on, on a canoe, of course. Long ocean voyages in large double hull canoes, navigated by highly skilled man, the wayfinder, who remained constantly on deck, often in a sort of trance-like trans -like state, sleeping little during the voyage. It was a dead reckoning type of navigation, relying on constant observation of his surroundings. The wayfinder memorized where the canoe had come from and knew its exact current location all the time. The sun was the main guide, following its, its exact points as it rose and set each day. During the middle of the day, and or when the clouds prevented observation of the sun or stars, they would use winds and swells for guidance. There are stories that the wayfinders sometimes jumped overboard and felt the swell as they were moving along to know where they were going. They felt the swells that way, or they would lie on their backs on the deck, sort of in a trance-like state and just feel the swell. So very um, sort of sophisticated <laughs> observation of environment. At night, of course, they would use the star pattern. And here's one here. It's a Carolinian uh, star chart. The rising and setting points of stars. Other indicators that they always use, air and sea patterns caused by the islands and atolls. So again, Travelling between the islands, they had a knowledge of how the islands would um, reflect wave patterns uh, and atolls and so on. And of course, they also observed the flight of seabirds. And the birds would uh, go home to roost to islands at night, of course, so they could see that. That, that was an indication, confirmation that they were getting to an island very often. So the whole wayfinding was a jealously guarded and very high state of family skill. It was passed down from father to son. No women got a look in. <laughs> Too busy having babies. Yes, that's right. So it, it, it was, a, you know, again, a generational thing, memorized through generation, all of this knowledge. Not written down, of course. Here's an example of some Polynesian star charts. Again, very um, complex. This is a Hawaiian uh, eastern horizon from Hawaii. And all the names there of the stars are um, in Hawaiian. This is a Carolinian star chart again, and another Hawaiian one here. And uh, this here says the south. It has the southern cross there. You can just see that, the southern cross. And it's, it's uh, named in Hawaiian. It points south always. So very sophisticated um, knowledge of astronomy. Now, during the December show and tell, Pam, uh, Pamela Tonkin uh, talked about Polynesian stick charts. So I'll just mention those. They were made from coconut fronds or pandanus, a root bound together with coconut senate and in geometric patterns. And they depict the sea currents around low-lying atolls. Small carry shells or coral pebbles indicated the islands. Uh, and the curved sticks represent wave patterns. So it was a way of depicting the, um, you know, some of the patterns that were memorized. They never carried them on a voyage. It was all memorized again by the navigators and each chart, each stick chart, was a closely guarded secret by the, uh, the navigator who made them. Um, they gauged, as I said, the, um, the patterns in the, in the charts by a sense of touch. 
literally feeling every motion of the, the vessel. Swells, refraction, and so on, as they came into contact with the slopes of islands and so on. Really, it was a significant contribution to the history of cartography. They represent a system of mapping ocean swells, not accomplished anywhere else. Sadly, um, after, the, after World War II, um, the, the use of stick charts um, came to an end, really, because travel between the islands by canoe hawkers, um, you know, planes and so on. Um, but the, when they continue to be made in Polynesia, there, there are very few people now who are able to read them and, and use them as navigational aids. They're mostly just sold as tourist trinkets when you do see them. So it, it was an interesting phase and, and again, an add-on tool for the, for the navigator. This though is the key uh, concept and it's a mental concept Attack central to navigation, difficult for Westerners to comprehend. And uh, just to mention that the Western concept of a chart, a map, is a two-dimensional uh, representation on a on a flat surface of a sphere, the Earth. Totally unfamiliar to traditional navigators in Polynesia and the Carolines, they did not understand it. When Cook showed to Pye his maps, it was, <laughs> you know, what's that? How did those islands get on that paper? And uh, it, it was totally, um, you know, foreign to, to them. So what's ETAC? ETAC is a dynamic framework of moving islands into which the navigator's knowledge of rate, time, geography, astronomy, all integrated into a statement of distance travel. So here's an example. The Etak Island is the one in the middle here. And latitude and longitude, for example, are meaningless in this. The voyage is divided up into stages. Etak, these lines here by the star bearings of a reference island. This is the reference island in the middle. And that's the Etak Island. Here's another one showing a lot of those um, Etak segments. So the navigator has a vast number of star courses stored in his memory that he's learned, star bearings of the Etak Island, see. And the canoe is down here somewhere. So he's, he's traveling in the canoe, which is here, and he's along the stages. What they do, and this is the bit that really is hard for us to understand as, as reference as Westerners. Um, they imagine that the island's moving and the canoe, canoe is stationary. So the reference island is moving under the stars. And uh, that, that's the whole concept, the mental concept, the framework that they're using. They're perfectly aware, of course, that the islands are not moving, but it's just a mental con concept and construct that they're using to, uh, to navigate with their memory of all the star bearings. So in a way, it was fortuitous that ETAC and the Western system of mapping and charting were so different that uh, <clears throat> it really assisted in the survival of the indigenous nav navigational concepts. If they'd been more similar, they might have uh, melded when the Europeans came, but they didn't because these systems were just so different. Well, okay, okay, so all of that <coughs> been going on for, <coughs> excuse me, been going on in the Pacific with the Polynesians for many, many years. When the Europeans came, they were still befuddled about, well, how did these people get here? They hadn't actually asked, how do you do your navigation? What, how did it work? So the debates continued. First of all, as you know, Thor Heyerdahl came along. He said they came from South America. 
1947, <coughs> and as you know, he did his Contiki expedition. Now, just, uh, you know, thoroughly um, uh, turned over. Nobody believes they came from South America now. So he, um, he sort of is consigned to the history books. Okay, 1956, an interesting one. Andrew Sharp, a historian, New Zealand historian. I don't know if any of you have heard of Andrew Sharp. He wrote this book, Ancient Voyages in the Pacific. And he, was, he had a very different uh, view. He challenged the view that Polynesian islands were settled intentionally by voyages of exploration and colonization. He said it was just romantic nonsense. They couldn't possibly have done it. He said it was <coughs> that the islands must have been settled by fortuitous, unintentional drift, <coughs> randomly directed voyages of exile because of overpopulation, famine, warfare, etc. But he, he didn't believe they could have actually sailed purposefully. He, he thought the canoes, the marine technology they had lacked keels and center boards. They couldn't make progress to windward. The vegetable fiber ropes that held the canoes together, he thought would fall apart in heavy seas. Didn't have the means to sail out to distant unknown islands. So he, he felt they could not have done two-way return voyages to islands with domesticated animals, plants, etc. And Hawaii, he said, was way out of range of voyaging capabilities. They couldn't have got there. <laughs> well, a lot of Pacific historians, anthropologists, and geographers disagreed with Andrew Sharp. So, next what happened, some experiments. So, okay, look, let's do some experiments here. See, see uh, you know, was Andrew Sharp right? Or, you know, have we, have we uh, not given the Polynesian due credit? So, to answer the questions of the Polynesian voyaging, navigation, and migration pattern, a bunch of geographers come along, which I was pleased to, to read about. 1964-65, and by then we had computers, big ones, and they did a computer simulation. So there were three of them. This chap was a computer science person in Canada. Jared Ward was at ANU, geography, human geography, and John Webb um, at Minnesota in the US, a geographer. What they did was try to simulate the, the patterns of wind and currents in the Pacific, all across the Pacific. It was an enormous task, but they had the computer to, to do it for them. There were something like 600,000 data points that they were registering. And this here is uh, what they ended up doing. Uh, and, and this was, they were saying, okay, if Andrew Sharp was correct, just drifting around, like the Polynesians, they could have maybe, you know, found all these island groups. So this was the experiment that they did. What did they find? It was unlikely that drifting canoes could have been the major means by which Polynesia was settled. They could not have passed the wind and current barriers in the Western Polynesia, Samoa, Tonga, and in Eastern Polynesia, Marquesas and Tahiti. So you see, there's nothing here. So if it was just by drift, the, the currents and the winds would have pushed them westward. They would not have got to Easter Island or Hawaii and even to New Zealand. There was no probability that they could have got there just by drifting uh, on the currents and the winds. So accidental drift to Hawaii was out of the question. The canoe from the south would have been pushed far to the west of Hawaii by the prevailing easterly trade winds. Sailing tests in Hawaii subsequently proved that double hulled canoes could sail downwind, a crosswind, and to windward. Remember, Andrew Sharp had said, oh, the boats couldn't possibly sail to windward. No keel. No keel. But they certainly was proven wrong, they could do that. 
And in fact, the, the geographers felt that really navigators sailing to Hawaii from the Southern Pacific, they didn't have, a, there wasn't a, a very small target. It was actually quite a big chain of islands to sail to. So it was quite a large target in a way from the South. They could have hit the Hawaiian chain. So their conclusion was that although drifting may have accounted for some island discoveries, most were settled probably intentionally by sailing voyages of exploration by the Polynesians. So that was an experiment very interesting. Now along comes David Lewis, another New Zealander. Um, interesting chap. He was born in the UK in Plymouth, grew up in Rarotonga in the Cook Islands, and then subsequently New Zealand. And he actually was a great sailor, even in the UK. He did some sailing events across the Atlantic and uh, went around the globe also. But what he did was interesting from our point of view this morning. He sailed from Tahiti to New Zealand without any modern navigation lights, instruments. He used methods which he picked up from listening to uh, Micronesians about the size, sun, ocean swells, etc. Traditional navigators, in other words. His uh, very important voyage in 1968, there was a chap called Hikua, a traditional navigator from Kuluwat in Micronesia. And he and David Lewis did a 1,100 1, mile round trip voyage between Kuluwat and Saipan in, in the Marianas without modern instruments. And uh, um, uh, just for the end of David Lewis's story, he actually retired to Australia, Gympie, and died in Gympie in 2002. Mm. But he wrote this book, We the Navigators, and there was the first edition in 1972. And uh, I have the second edition here, uh, 1994. It's a fascinating book. Um, it has a lot of technical detail about uh, Polynesian navigation, star charts and all sorts of things, diagrams. If you're interested, it's a very interesting book. So that was David Lewis, again, sort of feeding into this debate about how did the Polynesians get around the Pacific and how did they settle all these island groups. Okay, then we come to the Polynesian Voyaging Society. It was founded in Hawaii in 1973 by three chaps, Ben Finney, Herb Kane and Thomas Holmes, part the wines. They determined that, okay, once and for all, let's do an experiment to see if we can answer this question that had been posed by Cook and others. How did the Polynesians settle the far-flung islands of the mid-Pacific by accident or by design? Did their canoes and their knowledge of navigation enable them to sail purposefully over the vast sea distances between Pacific islands? Could the Polynesians have purposely sailed longer distances for example, the two, two, two five oh nautical miles between Hawaii and Tahiti. As some legends said, there's a legend, Mo Ikaha and Pa'au said to have done. So there were legends about this. Okay, enter this very important person, Pius Mao Pialu, master navigator from the Caroline Islands. They were still using at this time in the 70s, they were still using traditional wayfinding techniques and now was one of their navigators. He relied on the sun, stars, wind, clouds, seas, swells, birds and fish, as we said. And they were getting around quite happily throughout Micronesia and beyond using their traditional navigation systems. Again, it was all passed down, rote learning uh, through the generations. Mao became quite concerned by the mid-70s that 
his traditional practices of navigation were being were disappearing. That by then, as you can imagine, 1970s, a lot of Western influences coming into the Pacific. There had been World War II, of course, uh, American, Japanese, uh, uh, and you know, way beyond the original explorers, the Spanish and Cook and so on. Lots of Western influences coming in and diluting the traditional practices. So he was a bit concerned about that, more than a bit. He went to Hawaii and shared his knowledge with the Polynesian Voyaging Society. Just uh, later, we'll come back to Mao in a moment, but in the end, he was renowned as a Grand Master Navigator. He received an honorary degree from the University of Hawaii. He was honored by the Smithsonian Institute in, in the US and the Bishop Museum in Honolulu for his contributions to maritime history. Okay, so that's Mao. That brings us to the Hopulea. Mm -hmm. um, Arcturus, the star of gladness, the brightest star in the northern night sky. Remember, Hawaii is in the northern hemisphere. So this is the story of the Hopulea. Hokulea is a Polynesian double hull voyaging canoe. It was launched in 1975. They built it in Hawaii. And again, it was, a, it was part of this experiment that the Polynesian Voyaging Society wanted to do to test the, the theory that the Hawaiians could have uh, purposely settled Hawaii. So they wanted to recreate and test lost Hawaiian navigation techniques on this, this canoe. Actually, archaeological and linguistic analyses by that time, by the mid 70s, did point to the Marquesas and or Tahiti as the most probable origin of the Polynesians who reached Hawaii. So there was some Western scientific evidence as well, you know, to, to back this up thinking Okay, they probably did come from that area. They used Mao, the, the Micronesian nav navigator, on this first voyage of the Hokulea. Mao, because he was from the Western Pacific and knew all his stars very well from the Western Pacific, he didn't know, he was unfamiliar with the uh, Eastern Pacific and the Southern Pacific. He spent several months in the Bishop Museum in Honolulu in the planetarium, um, studying the Hawaiian and the Southern Hemisphere stars so that he could lead, navigate the canoe to Tahiti. And this is where I said at the beginning, there's a link to the hula, which unfortunately we weren't able to see, but we maybe put it on while you're having your morning tea. Because there are Hawaiian chart, uh, chants and legends which do tell of a two-way voyage between Hawaii and Tahiti. So they're linked to the hula in that way and they sometimes do uh, perform that. Okay, so that's the Hokulea, the boat, and they made their first maiden voyage in 1976. They set out from Maui on the 1st of May. Here's a map showing the route. Hawaii here, and it's approximately 6,000 nautical miles return from Hawaii to Tahiti. Under Mao's navigation, using only traditional navigation techniques. So again, no radio, no astrolabe, no sextant, no map, paper chart. He was just using his observations and what he knew about the stars and so on. 15 person crew, including the three who set up the Polynesian Voyaging Society, I think that's 15 return, with about seven or eight going down. Uh, Kauli means European Hawaiian, so Caucasians plus local Hawaiians. And on the return journey, there were two women sailors as well. <laughs> and uh, they weren't doing the hula on the voyage. <laughs> Um, anyway, the challenges of this voyage were twofold. First of all, the sailing. They wanted to prove that a double hull canoe could in fact tack to windward, cross windward, 
and um, and do those those sorts of um, voyages use, uh, going windward as well as with the wind. And then of course the navigational uh, challenge, which was Mao's area. Could he navigate the canoe without any modern aids from Hawaii to Tahiti? In fact, they crossed 500 miles of longitude on the first voyage. They had to go quite far to the east. Northeast trades north of the equator. They had to cross that, sailing well to windward. And then when they crossed the equator, the southeast trades south of the equator. They had to go quite far to the east in order to not end up way over here. They, they had to um, you know, chart their way so that they would end up in Tahiti. Now knew apparently exactly where he was during the one month voyage, according to the others in the crew. He wasn't lost at all. And again, uh, some of the stories you read about the voyage say that he often did hop over the side, test the swells, mm -hmm. uh, get back on, lay there on the deck, feeling the swells and so on. The food on that voyage, interestingly, was traditional. They tried to be as traditional as they could. So it was Polynesian food, fresh and dried fish, dried taro, uh, taro poi, that's a sort of uh, tuba um, plant, root, root food, like a starch, breadfruit, pandanus flour, coconut, and water. On that voyage, also importantly, they uh, now trained up some young Hawaiian navigators. The names there don't mean much to you, I'm sure, but Eddie Aok and Nino Thompson have become quite famous in Hawaii because they are now navigators themselves. They were trained up on that voyage. So that was important. Okay, so after one month, 34 days, they arrived safely in Papeiji Harbor in Tahiti. 34 days sailing, June the 4th. Over half the island's population turned out to welcome them. It's a nice picture there of you know, all the other canoes from Tahiti came out to welcome them. It was really quite a spontaneous acclamation of the shared Polynesian uh, heritage. Uh, they returned to help Honolulu, but now decided to return home to Micronesia. So on the return voyage, they did use some modern navigation um, because they didn't have now there to help. So the successful, this successful voyage was very significant because it proved the efficacy of Mao's navigational system, for one. It also proved that the Polynesians could have made a two-way voyage between Tahiti and Hawaii. And also that the, the canoe itself, the sailing, could have uh, sailed to windward across longitude from west to east as well. So it was uh, very successful. And really, it started off a whole um, revival, if you like, of Polynesian culture and, and canoe building in Hawaii, the Maoris in New Zealand, Tahiti, and in, in Hawaii, if, if you go there today, as you may know, uh, part of that cultural Hawaii, uh, revival has been to use Hawaiian language a lot more. So you see a lot of places, uh, well, there were quite a lot of places already with Hawaiian names, but many more. And there are more schools teaching uh, Hawaiian language and so on now. I think it was set off by this voyage of the popular. Okay, so finally, the uh, Malama Honua worldwide voyage of the Hokulea from 2013 to 2019. Um, Malama Honua means to care for our earth. And what they did was the voyage, they had many crews, they changed crews many times, but they voyaged all around the world with no compass no radar, no radio, and no GPS. And they found their way using the traditional methods. And there's the map of where they went over those years. 
2015, we were privileged, Ralph and I went to Cleveland where they had more for two weeks, the, the Hopulaya at Cleveland, and it was there for two weeks. Anyone else managed to see it? No. Uh, in 2015, it was great to see them. And when they went to the different uh, countries, they would change crews, give them a rest and so on. But they always had navigators trained up, of course, to, to be able to do it. They did have a, you know, what, what would you call it, a rescue ship tailing in case anything happened. But they never used any of the modern aids, navigational aids. Now, so lots and lots have been written about this. <laughs> Polynesian navigation. There's some books there on the table. Uh, David Lewis's book, I can highly recommend. Sea People is another one um, by um, oh, Suzanne, is it? Um, Christina, Christina Thompson. The Pacific by Simon Winchester. Uh, this is an older one, Wayfinders by Wade Davis. He concentrates mostly on Micronesia. And East is a big bird, again, a bit more, it's an older book, but again, concentrating on um, Micronesia. And Lynn mentioned at the beginning, Sam Neill's program. It was great. Did anybody see it? Yeah. Yeah, oh, look, it, it's just terrific, I thought. We, we really enjoyed it. Because it gave a bit of a balance between, you know, the Western perspective and the Polynesian perspective and what happened. And he did mention Chapaya, I think, quite a bit in there. So um, I highly recommend uh, Sam Neill. You can catch it on, he'll catch it, I think, on iView. So, mahalo, nui loa, thank you very much from Arawahini. That's my Polynesian name. Mm -hmm. And there's a story as to how, how I came to have Arawahini, which was translated into Iraqi. So, Malama Honua, as the Polynesians would say, planet Earth is our canoe in the universe. Take care of her. Thank you. That's it. Any questions from the oh, first? Question. Any questions? Or the Zoom? Yes. <coughs> you mentioned the, the Torhaido theory. Yep. At least one part of this theory seems to hang up, which is the sweet potato. Yes, it often comes back to the sweet potato. How did I get the sweet potato? Which is a staple. Probably mm. the sweet potato. But it makes sense that if they were so good as navigating large distances, they wouldn't hit South America. But there already were people in South America. Sure. So they wouldn't make Polynesian. Yeah. They could bring back some. They might have brought back the sweet potato, certainly. And if they got to Easter Island, which is still quite a long way to South America, uh, they certainly did get to Easter Island. But you're right about the sweet potato, yes. Mm -hmm. Part of the, uh, the theory of the mystery. Yep. Rafi, were you christened or uh, <laughs> And then change yeah okay the story is that <laughs> my mother um during world war ii had joined the uh, british red cross and her um good friend was also in the red cross who had been raised in new zealand but by a maori person and when the friend was uh, born uh she was given the name Arawahini. Oh. And it's supposed to mean spirit of woman. Wahini means woman. Yes. Um, however, um, her, her parents, who were English, thought, ah, oh, it's a bit too difficult for English people. So yes. they changed it to be a bit like Daphne. Yes. <laughs> and they got rid of the I, R, of the I, oh. and made it, um, yeah, they got rid of the, the, that and made it I, yes. Daphne. And as you may know, in Maori, PH is it anywhere. It's uh, an F sound, so that's remained. Right. Oh, by the way, I forgot to say, um, when that popular came back to Hawaii, so I went to Hawaii first of all. Um, slide, slide. 
Um, I was in Hawaii just after the Hokkaido came back, so that really piqued my interest. So, 1976, I arrived in Hawaii uh, just a, a, one year later in 77. And this whole business about the hockey layer and the cultural revival was really revving up. So that's where I, I um, started to get really interested in the navigate Polynesian navigation and, and the migrations mm -hmm. and so on. It, it was it was there just at that time, and they were um, trying to uh, again. Um, I think Mao did come back to Hawaii, and he again spent time training up um, young navigators. Um, yeah. The, um, most noise that you've been talking about were all internal to the Pacific and the other islands. Yep. And I believe that uh, archaeologists have determined that the Pacific essentially was populated from some population stream through Taiwan or something like that. Yes. It must have been very early uh, yeah. uh, skill development, wasn't it? I did mention that at the beginning of the year before this came. Um, yeah, no. Um, yeah, no. Right at the beginning. Um, oh, God. <laughs> yeah. I missed out. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. Yes. Here we go. Yes. Polynesian origin, origins. So, yes, it's thought that most likely they came out of southern China and made their way across to Micronesia initially uh, and then eventually reached some of the islands, Samoa, Fiji, Tonga, by about 800 before the Christian era. And then it seems they've quite a long pause before they set out again and went to the Cook Islands and some of the other islands. So this map here uh, does actually show some of those dates when they were thought. And of course, New Zealand was the last to be settled, around 1200, 1300 AD. Yeah. So, have, have you met the navigator Mao? And is he still alive? Oh, no, no, I haven't met Mao. I've met Nino Thompson, who, and I think when they came to Cleveland, it wasn't Nino Thompson. We, we did see the navigator there who was on that leg. Right. But no, no I think now. Probably it's long gone now. All right. But um, no, I don't know. But I've met his, some of his other yeah. His students. Yeah. Yeah. And the University of Hawaii actually has a, um, a course that you can do on um, navigation as well, which is quite nice. Mm. Any other questions? Anything on this? I'll hand over to you. Hey, thanks, Arati. I think Arati's done an excellent job there to bring together a lot of information and display it so display it so well. So thanks, Arati. So we will finish the recording here and we'll enjoy morning too. And Arati's got a, an excellent presentation. Here on the tables of uh, maps and um, and um, prints and books, so we can look at that while we're having a morning tea. And Ralph has pulled out those maps of the Pacific various things from the map, yeah, from our map. map of the Pacific right. Islands, yeah. there's yeah. the Cooks, Voyages, and also uh, uh, the geology of the sea. Bit unusual, and uh, there's also a uh, magnifying glass. I'm sure you'll need it because some of the fonts are very small. <laughs>